Hello, thank you for joining us for this Lawyers for Learners webinar, Know Your Rental Housing Rights. My name is Lexi Weber. I'm a graphic and web design student at Southwest Tech and I'm an intern with Lawyers for Learners. We're honored to have Mitch present this topic today. Mitch is the director of the Economic Justice Institute and Neighborhood Law Clinic for UW-Madison's Law School. Thank you for being here with us today and sharing your expertise. With that, I turn it over to Mitch. Thank you so much. Um, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Mitch. I'm a clinical professor at the um, uh, University of Wisconsin Law School. And what I'm going to share with you today is um, not legal advice, but a, hopefully a whole lot of really useful uh, legal information. So let's get started. Let's jump in. We have a little bit of time today to cover some basics. So what we're going to discuss today is security deposits, getting repairs done, eviction protections, and that's right, I added a fourth topic, which is feelings. Um, I wanna talk about that because I think that um, a useful way to actually retain the information that I wanna share with you today is to think about how you might feel if you're going through an issue with your security deposit, an issue with getting repairs to your home done, or an issue where you're confronting an eviction. And maybe not you, but maybe the people that you're working with, maybe your friends, maybe your students, maybe colleagues. It's feelings that we need to, to recognize, to discuss, and to think about, hey, there are in fact rights related to security deposits, repairs, and eviction protections. So first off, we're gonna talk about security deposits. So for security deposits, <clears throat> you have a lot of basic rights, but when you pay a security deposit, I want you to think of, want you to think about how that makes you feel, right? You just moved into a place or you're about to move into a place and you paid a huge amount of money to pay, pay for your rent, to, to, to get this place, you're excited, you've moved in, you've asked friends or family or hired folks to help you move and you've got this deposit. And when you move out, you really want that deposit back because you need to usually pay it for the next place that you move into. And if you don't get it back, how do you feel, right? You feel upset, you feel angry, you're stretched really thin financially because you have to pay rent and you've got the security deposit that's sort of stuck that you can't get back. So if you're feeling upset, if you're feeling angry, if you spot people who are, you need to be talking about housing with folks. How are you doing? Hey, I know, did you move this, this semester, this term? Where, where are you at now? You know, are you still on whatever road it is? You know, having discussions with people is what's going to help people remember and recognize their rights. Because you're here, you're taking this wonderful step of educating yourselves and being informed, but you need to have these conversations with other folks, with your friends to pass this along, right? So if you are in fact um, uh, dealing with anybody who has, who, who seems upset like that, and you can talk about housing, hopefully um, if they are experiencing, in, experiencing an issue with getting their deposit back, you can say, hey, I, I remember you've got some basic rights. So what are those basic rights? You should have a written itemized accounting or your deposit back within 21 days. This is super duper key. It's a very strong law in the state of Wisconsin. So everything I'm talking about is Wisconsin state law. If you've got somebody who happens to be commuting from another state, um, this doesn't apply there. If it came up in another state, um, they might not be familiar with this. Um, if it's the first time renting or their first time having a rental problem, they might not be familiar with this. But in the state of Wisconsin, if you rent a place anywhere in the state, you are supposed to get your security deposit back or a written itemized accounting within 21 days. Really important that, that you get that. If you don't get it, um, then as the last bullet point here says, renters can recover double their security deposit plus attorney's fees. So it's a huge, huge incentive for property owners to return security deposits um, is, is that if they don't return them or account for them within 21 days, um, uh, the owner of the property can be forced to potentially pay double the deposit plus cover uh, renters' attorney's fees. Security deposits cannot be withheld for normal wear and tear. So this is another feeling issue that I want to sort of expose. People will oftentimes feel that they feel a little bit guilty if the place that they rented was, um, wasn't in the best of shape. 
Uh, and we, we have a society where a lot of um, property owners will put in terms in leases that cannot be enforced, terms that um, seem to charge someone for normal wear and tear. What I mean by that is um, clauses like mandatory carpet cleaning. Um, carpets and anything that we all walk on, they get dirty, right? You walk on it, it's gonna get dirty um, from being walked on. It's gonna be um, used, it's, that's, that's very normal. Um, you cannot be charged for normal wear and tear. You can be charged for excessive damage, but not normal wear and tear. Um, so a lot of times people are charged, um, again, you'll see um, people charged for things like dust on fan blades or um, baked on grease in the oven. And I like to point out that nothing is more normal than dust accumulating on a fan blade. Nothing is more normal than cooking a pan of lasagna or just a frozen pizza and having a little bit of spatter in your oven, right? That's normal, 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 normal wear and tear, normal usage. I can't say it enough. You're not supposed to be charged for normal wear and tear. If you think about it, if you're ever having stayed in a hotel, right, and you leave and you maybe didn't make the bed or you left trash in the trash can, right, that's normal, um, right, that you would use the apartment, you would use a hotel room. Um, uh, the folks who run rental housing, um, they are supposed to build in that type of cost and the facts of, uh, excuse me, the fact that some basic normal cleaning needs to be done into the rent. And certainly rent is high enough that that should be built in. So we, we, you, you should not ever be charged for normal wear and tear, whatever that is, whether it's, you know, just the, the floor, the carpeting has worn down, things like dusting, things like basic cleaning. And again, you should get, as it says here, an itemized accounting within 21 days. What itemized means is it's supposed to describe each item that um, of any type of damage or any reason that your deposit is withheld. So just a, 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 an accounting that simply says cleaning, that doesn't describe what was cleaned um, or uh, damage, that doesn't describe what was damaged, doesn't count. It is in fact insufficient or illegal. Um, and again, renters could potentially recover double any amounts that are wrongfully withheld or not accounted for within 21 days. So how do you go about <clears throat> making sure that you get your security deposit back, you know, talking to somebody, and again, if they're going through this, if you're going through this, um, some steps that you can take, right? So you can send a letter, you can send an email within 21 days, or excuse me, after 21 days, again, um, owners have 21 days to, to send out um, uh, the full deposit or an accounting of what's withheld. So you can send an email or a letter after 21 days asking about where my deposit is. Uh, you can go online to the department, the State Department, Wisconsin's Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. You can file a free complaint there, Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection, really that last part, the Consumer Protection uh, Unit there. We'll look into, they'll send a letter um, out to the, um, to the property owner and, and ask them what their response is. If that doesn't work, you can contact a lawyer uh, for help filing a suit in small claims. Um, a couple of tips um, that, that I, I need to say about, you know, hopefully avoiding this um, and just being ready in every situation ever, not just security deposits, keep good records. What does keeping good records means with respect to rental housing? It means when you move into a place, take photos, take video, right? Do a video walkthrough on your phone of the place when you move in so that you get everything. Particularly take photos of any damages, any cracks, any, any breaks, you know, make sure that everything works. Um, <clears throat> do the same thing when you move out. You know, as a matter of fact, it's great if you look at the video that you made when you move in and when you're moving out to, to make a similar video where you walk through in the sort of same order through the same rooms um, and, 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 and make sure you capture everything in that video. Um, keep payment records. So a lot of folks pay, they'll pay in cash, they'll pay with a money order. Um, please, please, please try to keep payment records. One Thing besides damages um, that are alleged uh, uh, is, a, is a failure to pay. So try to keep records of any payment. Um, money orders don't typically come with a record unless you hang on to the little receipt there. Um, checks are wonderful because you can go to your bank and actually get a, a bank statement 
That's true if you keep that bank account open. But we have a lot of folks that who are who are new renters or um, who just simply don't um, have bank accounts that you will pay with cash or money orders. Make sure that you either insist that the owner give you a receipt. If you are paying in cash, you have a right to get to demand a written receipt. Um, but if you are paying with a money order, um, best record is probably a photo of it, right? Made out to whoever your property owner is before you turn it over. Um, so that's that's going to be one thing to do. Um, keep uh, keep records of your payments. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so so that's security deposits. A couple of quick tips on how to avoid um, problems um, uh, or be ready for them is, is to have those photos, have those videos, have those payment records ready to go. Also, make sure that you hang on to a copy of your lease. Nobody hangs on to paper anymore. We don't do files. So again, I would say take out your smartphone, take a photocopy or take a picture of each page of your lease. Just have it there, you know, backed up to your, you know, limitless cloud storage of photos and, and be ready to have that should a dispute come up. Um, it's going to be really important to see what's in there. Um, and to be able to assert your rights later. So um, encourage folks if they are, you know, maybe before they're having these negative feelings of being stressed out, they're feeling upset, they're they're anxious, they're they're tired because they're working extra hours because they have to pay two security deposits. Um, if they're excited, they're asking for help moving in, you know, they're talking about their new place, tell them to do these things. Hey, you know, if you didn't take a video already, please take a video of the place that you moved into. Please take a bunch of photos. And, and hey, if you still got your lease, make sure you take photos of that. Much better to get those things, um, get them recorded early, get an extra copy of your lease if you didn't um, before the problem arises. Tell them, hey, you know, make sure whenever you pay rent, you, you get some sort of record or some sort of receipt if you aren't paying with checks. All right, so that's security deposits. I wanna move on to our second topic, which is about repairs. So you got to know your rights here. And one, some of your rights are the rights to live in a safe, healthy building, right? So what happens if you don't? What happens when you see somebody who's, <clears throat> who's tired again, you know, like, you know, it might be anything in their life, you know, not all problems come from housing, but they are often linked. So if somebody is tired because they can't sleep because there's a leaky pipe or the, you know, there's some other sort of problem, you know, leaky roof, whatever it is, the heat's just too cold. Um, you know, in the winter and they're shivering and they can't get a good enough sleep, so they're doing poorly. You talk about how the, you know, how things are going with housing. If you see people having those feelings or expressing that type of a situation, let people know that they can notify the building owner, right, um, uh, of any repair needs. It's super important to get notice out there to the building owner. Full disclosure, I, I teach rental housing law. I usually represent renters in court all of the time, but I also own rental property myself. Just yesterday, I got a, I got a, uh, was contacted by one of my renters who said that the dishwasher didn't work. Um, you know, there's a leak with the dishwasher. My very first response was, thank you for letting me know. I wouldn't know unless that they, they told me. And the biggest thing, the reality, unfortunately, is that a lot of people are afraid to reach out to a maintenance person, afraid to reach out to uh, the owner, afraid to request a repair. But if you don't request a repair, if you don't tell the owner that there's a problem, they will never know. And I train and I go out and I speak with renter, rental property owners. Um, and I say, you know, the first thing that you should do is say thank you. This is super important so that you can keep the property in good shape um, so that um, the leak doesn't become like a, a massive uh, sort of problem, you know, because it's destroying the wood or anything underneath. So please, please, please notify it and notify owners or building managers, whoever it is, notify them in some type of writing that you keep a record of. So my suggestion on the screen here is an email. Notify them in an email. You'll have a copy of that. Um, I suggest that you ask them if they can make a repair by a certain date. Can you please fix this, you know, this week or by next week, whatever it is. Um, and if, it, if you, you know, you can end that with saying, you know, if, you, if this date doesn't work, can you give me a date so that I can be sure when this is going to be taken care of? It's really good to sort of set up a couple of other rights in the law to suggest this date, right? So it's notice. And if you can suggest a date um, that you'd like to see it fixed by, do that politely. 
Um, uh, you get more sort of good responses typically by at least first asking politely um, in that documentation. But asking for a date is very helpful down the road should it not get fixed by a certain date. <clears throat> you can also notify the building inspector. If you live in the city of Madison, you live in the city of Fitchburg, um, you live in a lot of in, uh, municipalities, they will have a, a building inspector who inspects rental property. Um, the Tenant Resource Center, um, so tenantresourcecenter.org, um, has a wonderful list on, on repairs of phone numbers for building inspectors throughout the state of Wisconsin. Not every city has one, but you can go there, you can call, um, uh, you can find your local municipality. If you're still having a problem, you can call them right away at the same time that you notify the building owner or afterwards, um, but definitely is a really wonderful resource to notify the building inspector. In certain cities, the building inspector can order the uh, owner to make repairs right away, which is really, really useful. It's a much faster process than going to court is to get an order from the building inspector that property get repaired. Um, Again, uh, folks moving from out of state, I know enough. I know very little about like the technical aspects of the law, but I know that a lot of folks from other states are terrified about contacting the building inspector because they're scared of retaliation by the owner. So they have this feeling that I don't wanna do this, I can't do this. People talk about feeling stuck. Um, uh, in Wisconsin, we have very strong protection of retaliation. So if you do contact the building inspector and your owner then says anything, to, to sort of retaliate, to take it out against you, to raise your rent, to try to evict you. You are protected from that in the state of Wisconsin. Um, you also don't have to worry. I know in other states, the, there's a sense that if you contact the building inspector, the building inspector is going to throw you out, that they're gonna come in and they're gonna say, oh yeah, this, this place isn't fit. Um, you know, there's some code violations. And so we're gonna kick you out of the home, right? That, can happen only if the place is literally a, a sort of immediate safety danger. Um, and if you're living in a place where it's in an immediate safety danger um, and you're paying rent, you shouldn't be. The building inspectors are, are, are really good about not kicking people out. Um, uh, based on my experience doing this for over 15 years in Wisconsin, they're not gonna kick people out um, for a, a, a leaky roof, uh, for some plumbing that is is really malfunctioning. Um, they're only going to keep people out if there's really truly uh, the, the building could burn down um, or, or there's some major sanitary concern. Um, it's very, very rare. So you should feel safe contacting the building inspector. Really important option uh, to notify the building inspector there. Finally, one thing not to do with repairs is don't withhold your rent unless you have an order allowing you to do so. So a lot of people will talk about this. They'll say, oh, you know, I'm upset. Again, this feeling I'm upset, you know, my apartment isn't fixed, I told the manager, and then they'll withhold rent, they'll not pay some of the rent. And if you don't pay your rent, um, uh, if you do that without a court order in the state of Wisconsin, you can have, you can be evicted, right? So calling the building inspector is protected, but withholding money is not protected. It's very, very dangerous. There, there's some ways to do it, but mostly you need a court order in advance. And again, the building inspector is one way that you can get that type of an order. You can also potentially go to court. Um, again, other states, maybe you can do it safer. In Wisconsin, <clears throat> particularly, um, it's very dangerous to withhold any rent money without an order. So I so strongly suggest not to withhold that. Um, so the final thing that I wanna talk about is some eviction protections. Um, <clears throat> so you have a, um, a, a right to notices before you get removed. So again, if somebody is facing an eviction, how are they feeling? They're feeling devastated. They're feeling like they got, you know, like sort of the, the wind knocked out of them. They're like, um, they're terrified. They're, they're again, you know, restless because they're trying to find another place to live, can't pay for one place potentially. Um, you know, can't find housing because housing is so, there's such a shortage of affordable housing. Um, and there's a ton of confusion about evictions. So you have a right to, to be notified. Um, you have a right to get a notice. So typically that's a five day, 14 day, 28 day notice. Depends upon the particular circumstances, but you have a right to advance notice and actually not just before removal, but before a court action. So it says right to notices, plural. You have a right to get notified um, uh, of, of any type of um, issue um, that might lead to you getting evicted. So if you get something that says eviction notice, it's only the first step in a lengthy process 
A lot of people get an eviction notice. They think they have to move out tomorrow. That's not true. Also, owners cannot come over and kick people out, rip them out. They can't change the locks. They can't throw your stuff out on the curb. They can't shut off your utilities, can't shut off your water, your gas, any of those things. Only a sheriff can remove a renter, and they can only do that after they got a court order. So multiple notices happen. You'd have to get three different notices before the sheriff shows up and pulls you out. So um, you have a right to notices. Um, if you get a notice, um, defenses and resources exist. Biggest recommendation there is to take action quickly if you do get this notice, but know that it's not the it's not the end of the world. You may be able to have defenses. You may be able to have resources available to you, right? Um, uh, to to help pay rent, um, to to address any issues that are potentially leading to evictions. <clears throat> so. The takeaway here is to remember that you as renters or your friends, colleagues, students have rights. You have these rights to get your deposit back, to get your repairs done, to, to have notice and hearing before an eviction. And you all can help, right? Not just by attending this, but thanks for listening today. But you want to talk about housing. If you see people experiencing really rough feelings, restlessness, anger, upsetness, talking about how money is tight. Um, you know, you can bring up the housing topic. It's okay to talk about housing um, with folks to sort of, you know, uh, take away some of the embarrassment that people might feel or misplaced shame that people might feel. Let them know that they have rights. So there are resources available to people. Those resources, um, right, you got Lawyers for Learners here. So come to the website, fill out that intake form. For Lawyers for Learners, they can connect you up with a lot of good folks um, uh, that, that actually practice rental housing law. Uh, the Tenant Resource Center is another great um, organization. Again, I mentioned it has the numbers to contact for everybody statewide. So I want to highlight them. And uh, there's their um, information uh, on um, how to get a hold of them. So I'm going to now go to any questions that folks have. Um, so first question, is there a retaliatory protection statewide? Yes, there's retaliation protection statewide. Absolutely. If you want chapter and verse, it's WSTAT 704.45 and Wisconsin Administrative Code 134.09. So yes, statewide. Um, where is the list of building inspectors statewide? On the Tenant Resource Center's website. So if you go to the Tenant Resource Center's website, you should be able to find uh, that list of resources. <clears throat> um, uh, it's under the repairs page, um, and they have a list of different numbers to contact there. Um, there is one, um, this person had no heat for most of the winter. Um, they contacted the building ins inspector twice. Uh, they helped the first time, but they did not help the second time they contacted. Um, the landlord never repaired or fixed the heat, and they have moved out since. Um, and they aren't letting them out of their lease. Um, they're having a hard time finding a lawyer or legal assistance on filing a small claims court case. Um, and are there any lawyers or other services that are recommended to to look at for a small, smaller budget. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm sorry to hear that situation. I'm really glad that you're able to get out of there and and, and be in a safe place that has heat. Um, uh, um, again, Lawyers for Learners here, right? There's an intake form on the website um, and they connect up with a bunch of different legal service providers, um, some of which are free or low cost. Um, so that's a great starting point. If you haven't checked that out already, they connect up with legal action offices other nonprofits, other lawyers that do this type of work. Also, if you're, if you're, um, think about starting and going into this area. There aren't enough, just like there's not enough affordable housing, there's not enough people doing rental housing law, helping out other people with their rental housing. I'm doing what I can. I teach at the law school. I'm trying to teach people every year. I teach students how to do this type of practice. Um, uh, it, it is a sustainable practice. So please think about <clears throat> if you can't find those resources and you really uh, identify with this. I know I had problems uh, when I was renting, um, when I was a student um, with, with a really nasty uh, habitability, terrible leaks, 
in my apartment. And it was one of the things that motivated me to want to go into housing law. So, um, you know, try to try to first get help, get in your safe situation and then maybe pay it forward if, you, if, if, if it fits with your sort of career aspirations. Um, is there specific guidance regarding cost of repairs? For example, how much can a landlord charge for damaged floors, et cetera, at move out? No, there isn't a set um, list of, uh, of, 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 of costs for, um, for, for particular types of repairs. Everything is on a uh, sort of case by case basis. Uh, I will highlight again that you cannot be charged for normal wear and tear. And um, uh, if, if you are charged for anything, the owner has to prove that charge. It's their burden to prove that they um, uh, uh, needed to spend what they needed to spend. Uh, so I had somebody who had a tiny, tiny little nick in a hardwood floor. The owner replaced the entire hardwood floor um, and billed the renter thousands of dollars for replacing the hardwood floor. We ended up going to court and the owner couldn't prove that they had to replace the entire hardwood floor. They caved and acknowledged that they could have replaced just a board or two. Um, and, and that went really well for the renter. So, yeah. Um, is it legal for a landlord to require you to pay a separate fee directly to the maintenance person, not the rental company for locking yourself out of the building? Is it legal for the owner to make you pay for someone to let you back in? I don't know a law that prohibits that type of a charge. Um, it should be reasonable. There is a general overarching doctrine or, or legal principle that applies in all situations whereby you shouldn't be forced to pay an exorbitant sort of price gouging fee. But if you um, ever lock yourself out and you call a locksmith, if you were to own a home or you, you lock yourself out of your car, you know that those professionals can, can charge quite a hefty sum. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with passing on along that charge. But if there is in fact, uh, there is a law that says if the, um, if the owner only has to pay 10 bucks because they have a deal with their maintenance guy, um, then the owner can't charge you a hundred bucks. Uh, for being locked out. So if you have like an on-site maintenance person, you shouldn't be ch you should not be charged a hundred dollars for that on-site maintenance person to come, you know, down the hallway and let you into your apartment. Um, is a landlord required to repair slash replace a faulty air conditioning unit in a duplex? Uh, professional stated it should be replaced and can no longer be repaired. Um, so the law says that services um, and appliances and those types of things that are provided with the unit um, are, um, uh, are supposed to be repaired and fixed because it's what you bargained for, right? You, you bargained for and you decided to rent a place, for instance, that had an air conditioner. So if suddenly that air conditioner breaks down, if your refrigerator breaks down, if you bought the place with laundry in the basement and then they just it breaks and they say you got to go to the laundromat, that's not what you bargained for. You bargained for a place with those appliances. And yeah, the law says that, that you, should, you should have those things fixed. So again, this is one or said, put it in writing, put it in, you know, say, hey, like this is broken down, please fix this. If they continue to refuse, if you've got a building inspector, let them know. Um, uh, and if that doesn't work and you fill out your, your, your complaint form with the Department of Ag, Trade and Consumer Protection, you fill out the intake form with Lawyers for Learners. So those are your steps. Um, what kind of options do tenants have to stay after an eviction? <sighs> Um, well, in any case where a renter is, has an eviction filed against them or is threatened, um, you can always potentially work something out with the owner. And that's, that's um, a lot of times most evictions are about money. And so if you can work out some type of an agreement whereby you pay or you get assistance, um, there, there may be a way to, to work out staying. Um, <clears throat> uh, but after an eviction has been entered, unless there's an agreement after the it has gone to court after the, the owner has received a court order, um, which orders the sheriff to remove you. The only way then that you stop that typically uh, is by getting um, the, the owner to say, you know, no, because then the owner can notify the sheriff, no, I don't want this person evicted. I've made a new agreement. Um, so seek out resources to pay rent or seek out new agreements or seek out legal 
representation to, to, to dive into the specifics of why uh, the eviction was there. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us and have a nice rest of your day.